Uh, what we're going to see today is this kind of three things. First, we try to identify what, what quality is and data quality is. And uh, it's hard to define data quality, uh, but we try to give a, uh, uh, to, to define it. And then we see how we can identify data quality issues and different ways of we can actually tackle them. So what is data quality? It's, it's not easy to answer because quality in general is, is not easy to define. Uh, let's say, for example, quality of life. So we have a quality of life index that is published every year. And what this says is that based on some, some metrics like uh, house price or uh, consumer power or criminality, pollution in, in the area, different factors play a different role and make a general factor that you can actually say if one city is better than the other. Um, who's an Android guy here? <laughs> who's, an, <laughs> who's an iOS guy? <laughs> we win. <laughs> no, I'm not starting flamers here, but yeah. Uh, there are different aspects to, to quality also in operating systems. The point I'm trying to say is that data quality as any kind of quality is multidimensional. There are many different aspects that you can actually do and, and evaluate to assess the quality of, of, of a data set. It's not black and white. And some things, the same thing can be good for one case and not good for another use case. For example, we have three snippets here. Uh, Fu, which is a DBpedia person, has DBpedia birth date, which is uh, 1st January 2000. Bar, which is a fourth person, uh, which is fourth age 18. And Buzz, which is uh, Wikidata properties, P31, uh, Q5, which is a human, and P569, which is birth date. Is any of this better than the other? I'm biased to DBpedia, of course, but people who are used to consuming DBpedia data will find DBpedia most, more useful, people with both, and, and so on. So it's not a straight answer. Uh, another example, we have chickenpox, which is an infectious disease. Uh, it has rash, fever, and headache as symptoms, which are text. And we say that this can be treated with vari varicella vaccine. And varicella vaccine is actually uh, a vaccine that treats both chicken pox and herpes zoster. Uh, would you use this formation to build something like a visualization, like a graph that shows diseases and vaccines and, and symptoms and yeah, have something quite cool that you can showcase your, your libraries? Yeah? <laughs> uh, a disease website that people can go and look up for, for diseases and, and look up information? Yeah, maybe if not too demanding for, for the audience. Would you use it for treating automated uh, software? So if it finds like if you have a headache, then it will give you a vaccine? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. So the point here is that data quality is, again, fitness for use. So the exact same information can be perfectly good for driving in one use case, but completely uh, not, not good enough for something else. And there are different dimensions that actually capture data quality. There are four main themes that do that. It's accessibility, which means ways of accessing and retrieving data, complete data or part of the data. Uh, contextual dimensions that are related to the user context or the use case of, of, of or the consumers of the data. Uh, interesting ones, which are about, uh, are independent of any context and are, are universal. And of course, the representational ones, which is about how you represent the data and how you design the data. And we'll have a, uh, some few of them, like highlights of these dimensions, to showcase what exactly I mean. Uh, there is a very good research work by a colleague, Azaveri, which has all these details in, in, yeah, uh, in a very structured format and very highly uh, detailed. So accessibility dimensions, which means that can you access the data? If you cannot access them anymore, then it's, it's not good for you, even if it's the best kind of data you can have. Same with license. If you cannot use the data, then it's not good for you. So the quality for you, it's actually zero. And performance, if, if you can actually get them in a reasonable time to drive your, your application. If not, then again, it's no good. Uh, contextual means about uh, if the data is relevant for your use case, as we saw before. Uh, can you actually use them? Does it cover your, your, your applications? Uh, do you trust the publisher? Or is the publisher good enough for this kind of data? Maybe he's not good enough for other kind of data. Uh, do you understand the format and the data? Is there any documentation about it? Uh, which is also highly relevant to your use case. If you're used to consuming a specific format and other people don't, then you, the quality for you is better than the others. And of course, freshness of the data. Is it stored? 
or, or up to date, this is actually quality as well. Uh, increasing dimensions are actually uh, universal. Is the, for example, the file valid syntax? Uh, are the outliers? Are there labels correctly used in the data? Uh, are there any consistencies in, in between the, the values in the, in the file? Uh, are there duplicates? Is there ambiguity? Or what is, does null mean in the data? Is it, is it no value or is it something special? Uh, an example here, for example, is construction year that we have in our domain. Is it construction year, the year it started, or the year it ended? Sometimes it's kind of ambiguous, and it's, it can be a big difference in, in what you actually get in the end. And of course, completeness, if, if you have everything or, or part of it. And representational is about uh, are the labels and everything you use actually correctly used or reused across the, the files? Otherwise, you might have trouble mapping everything to the same vocabulary. Uh, this is more on the data side. I mean, is the data self-descriptive? The metadata, can you access them automatically? And can you provide the data in multiple formats or languages, which is also an indication of quality. Uh, the other thing that you need to see after you define all the metrics, you need to see how much uh, quality do you actually need. Uh, the thing is that there are very great costs involved in, in assessing the quality. I mean, and in finding how much quality is this data for you, and also there are great costs in improving the quality of a data set. And these costs actually depend on three things, whether the data are within your control, outside of your control, or if you bought the data. If it's outside of your control, then you probably can assess them, but not easily improve them. Uh, if it's in your control, then you have more control of the data, and if you have bought it, maybe you have some leverage with the provider, and you can have some, some yeah. But there is still, Costs involved in, in keeping continuously assessing the, the data you have. And in the end, you actually need to identify how much quality is good enough for your use cases. Because if you try to get more than you need, then you have more costs in your data. If you have less than you need, then this impacts your, your products and your consumers. So you need to get it right to get the best value. So we identified what quality means, and then we need to see where usually things can, can go wrong or where data can, can go wrong. In a typical data integration case, as you have a set of sources, one or more sources, uh, you have a master schema that you map, you, you use, use for your knowledge graph. You map your input data into your master schema. You have some rules that you apply on, on the data. And then you do identity resolution and data fusion. Uh, we won't get into details about identity resolution and data fusion because it's quite a complex topic for, for for this time, but we'll list all, all the other things and see that there can be errors in all these kind of phases. So uh, you all have experience with actually uh, bad data. They, you expect to be structured. There are semi-structured or semi-unstructured at the end. Then it can be messy, different data, so incomplete data and so on. Uh, but one common thing it, it's, it's actually hard to do it with that data is that you can actually not actually fit it into a schema. So you have a domain. You model correctly. For example, you say number of bathrooms is an integer as a number of, of, of rooms in a building. And then you go into Switzerland and you find out that it can be a float. <laughs> so the data that you actually, the real world, are not what you expect to be always. So you need to keep refining your, your, your schemas and everything. And it's quite hard to do this and every time you have a new source. Uh, on your master schema, there can be different types of errors. like incorrect modeling, so the modeling is not good enough to drive the use cases you have. Uh, you don't model the complete domain. It's also a quality issue. Um, there are cases where you have an accurate translation from the conceptual model into the actual real model. Uh, for example, you want to have your model into your paper, and then you have to move it into SACL, all RDFS, sex, and so on. And the way you translate it back, you have some errors in the translation, or you have undesired expressivity. You won't have a reasoning on all DL, and then you, by mistake, you add something into your schema, and then you go into all full, for example, and all your reasoning is, is, is ruined. Uh, mappings. This is a very big common source of errors, actually. Uh, incorrect mappings actually scale to the data size, which can be up to millions or billions of data. So if you have a CSV file and you map one column incorrectly, then every single value in your actually data gets, maps in, gets mapped into an error. And this actually propagates into your data. And fixing these things 
after the data is, is fused into your master schema, then it's quite hard to, to, to trace them and fix them back. In complete mapping, you don't map everything, of course. Uh, there can be also software bugs when you run your mappings, like in the ETL code or how, how you execute them. And another common uh, theme is, is when you don't have a good model sync. So you have your mappings and your schema, and you update your schema, and you need also to update the mappings accordingly. Otherwise, there is a sync between them, and which might get into your data. Uh, validation rules. Uh, I didn't choose a specific format. You can have different types, like all, circle, sex. But uh, if you, by mistake, for example, give birth date, like a mass cardinality of one, instead of mean, uh, or the other way around, then you can actually get errors that you cannot easily identify in the end. Or if you say that birth date must be XST date, then in the best case, you have an error. In the worst case, you identify it very late in, in the process, and you, when you try to see why you have a birthday with, with a string. And, oh, oh. Sorry, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and again, this is part of the model thing. So if you update your model, then you need to also update the validation rules accordingly. Um, the other thing about quality is that it, it actually evolves a long time. So your data evolves, you got new data sources all the time, which means that you need to update your schema, you need to update your mappings, and, and your constraints as well, and then you, your code, that ETL code or other code, and your Sparkle queries and everything. And the problem actually here is it's not only local on your team, it goes to the whole organization because the data you produce are actually consumed by other people or other teams. And aligning the life cycles between data engineering and other teams uh, is a very challenging task. There was a project that I was involved, it was a line project that was working on this, this problems, uh, and it's, it's a quite hard issue. It's not only uh, technical, it's also organizational issue that you need to make up here. Okay, so sounds good so far. Uh, now what? There are different strategies for, for managing uh, quality. There are three main things. Uh, you have data testers, which are explicit roles, like you have uh, someone who's hired to do that, or you are a software engineer that you identify an error, then you try to debug it, or, or an ontologist and so on. Um, you have crowdsourcing, which can be either for, for field experts that are very well in the domain, they try to identify issues in your data, or you can do this on the mechanical turk, depending on what you want to identify. And you can also have executable validation rules, which can be circle, sex, or all. Um, the thing here is that you actually need very good tool support, otherwise you are wasting time and, and money. Uh, if you got your engineers trying to, to get access to the data without good, good tools and, and tool support, then you're actually stealing time from the development in doing these things. So you need to develop tools that help them debug things better. And generic tools are kind of missing at the moment, so usually you have to develop them on your own or based on your own data. Uh, for field experts or mechanical tech, we have some, some work done in the past. Uh, you need to have, again, a very good interface in order for, for the expert to be able to find these issues and, and give them some, some tools that can uh, see the data, browse the data, and, and flag the data as wrong. Otherwise, it's, it's quite hard for them to, to do this thing. Uh, there are some links that you can actually see later on. And on the executable validation rules, it's actually something that you must be doing. Uh, the good thing here is that you have a lot of options and validation rules are actually improved at the moment, so it's, it's something that is, is encouraging. Um, next, so what you need to do actually is you need to move your validation closer into the, the error source, uh, which is quite important. So you need to first validate the model. Do you need to have, do you allow cycles in your hierarchy? Do you allow multiple domains and ranges? Uh, do you allow multiple uh, data types and so on? Uh, these things need to be checked whenever you change your model because you might do things by mistake and, and this actually propagate. Uh, after that, you need to also validate the rules. Are the rules now in sync with the model? Do you check things that are now obsolete or depre deprecated? Or are, is their state indeed a property? Or do you need to find uh, something else? Uh, you also need to validate the idea of mappings. Uh, there is a lot of research in this area. So we did an experiment with Wikipedia and validating the complete Wikipedia data set. It took us around 20 hours to run the validation. Uh, and we identified a few 
billion errors there. And what we did there, well, then we converted the mappings into RDF, and then we had tried to sync the, the, the mappings into the model and see if the model is inconsistent with the mappings or if the mappings were using the model in the wrong way. And this took around 11 seconds to run, and the errors identified actually account for 30% of the errors in the end data. So the, the time it takes to validate the mappings, it's much faster, and you can actually find a lot of errors before they propagate into your data. And you can also validate experts. So have some sample data, run them into your mappings, and then uh, check the, the results of that, which is small in size. And of course, you also need to validate your instance data. But this is, you do this anyway. Uh, the thing here is that uh, if you validate these things uh, easily, uh, early, these are always in the k triples, triples range. It's not big, so you can easily validate in memory. And even if your data is, is quite big, or billions or billions of data, this is always in the k side. So you can easily actually uh, validate in memory. The problem here is that if you skip something here or you miss something here, then also the error scale with the source. So anything that goes beyond this phase actually propagates into the data, and it's quite hard to fix later on. Uh, the other point I make is, is you need to, to automate things, because even if you do manual testing, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to find the errors. Can you find the error here? So have an EX name, which is an RDF lang string, and we have foo person, which is a DVP data person, and has X name foo with English. Can you spot the error? So it's actually the language is, is in the string, not out of the string. So this is quite hard to, to find. And we had these kind of errors, and we found them quite late. And without automation and validation scripts that are running automatically, it's quite hard to get them with, with yeah, uh, manually. And the other point is that you need to automate things. And how you automate, you need to do this with the CI. You, you don't have many options at the moment. There are no big tool support for RDF or graph database. So you need to treat data as code. And then you need to reuse um, tools like Jenkins, Travis, GitLab, TeamCity, and so on that do uh, code checking to do it for your data. Uh, so you need to trigger validation on every change you make in your data, on your schemas. And if you're brave enough, you need to fail everything until this is fixed. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, and this way, you can actually make sure that, that errors don't, don't go beyond that part. And for the cross-functional teams and within the organization, you need to also create data integration tests, uh, because this helps make sure that the things you build as a data engineer also works with the engineering team. And, and they actually are compatible and all the, the things are working. And like with code, uh, if the green CI is green, it doesn't mean you don't have bugs or the errors in the data. It means that you don't have enough tests. So you need to keep improving and adding uh, tests in your test suite and, and put this in the CI and automate things as much as possible. Uh, otherwise, things can, can go out of control. Uh, so as a recap, uh, Data quality is actually fitness for use, meaning the same data can be good for you or not good for someone else. And you can assess the data with different quality dimensions, which can also be contextual. Um, you need to identify the quality you need, actually, uh, and more or less can actually hurt your, your pocket or your product. And you need to look for errors into the schema, the rules, and the mappings, because it's a big source of errors, usually. Uh, you need to validate closer to the source. Otherwise, the errors propagate, and it's quite harder to identify and trace back. And you need to automate as much as possible. The CI is a very good option for that. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Um, you know, I, 
tips and tricks uh, how to, you know, because everyone wants to uh, have clean data and uh, with uh, the cheapest as possible, which is, uh, you know, sometimes you, you have uh, you have easy right way to data quality and uh, the price is must, must be balanced. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a thing. Grab in, grab out. That, that, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, if the data you have is not good enough, then the product you you you, you have will not yeah, come up to your data. So you need to find the balance. And, and do, do you know any, any, any tips and tricks? Uh, I don't know approach how to trade your data. This 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 uh, one of the slides that using uh, trading data as a, as a as a code uh, is quite good. Uh, so I have a library called Adafune, which is open source, and it's a Java library that you can actually, it also has JUnit integration, so you can have a different JUnit test, and you can put this into the yeah, code, for example, which is, yeah. Uh, so you, you focus mostly, at least that was my impression, on, on uh, like syntactic and structural issues that could, can be handled more with this, let's call symbolical methods. Uh, what about what's the strategy with with more like semantic side of things? So, say uh, a sub concept is classified wrongly under another uh, under another class. Is it is would machine learning methods be of any help, or only going to experts is the domain experts would be the the, the basic way? Um, I haven't experienced any way of doing this machine learning. I don't. Could be possible, but you need a lot, of, a lot of data to do that. So, if you're in a position you have a lot of data that you can actually train models to do that things, then probably yes. But if you are operating in a small scale, then this could be quite hard to to do that. At least the way, yeah. But you don't have a lot of experience in the field. Um, a question for uh, Shahon. Um, so you did a very good work with Holger, uh, actually have it in as a standard from W3C. Do you have any plans uh, in the context of GeoFi uh, to work on standardizing Shackle rules as well, which is now in the advanced features? We in Refinitiv have a big interest and we want to participate and push towards standardizing rules as well. Do you have any plans for that? Not at the moment. We haven't, yeah, don't have any use case at the moment for that. Okay, since you have your colleagues here, maybe yeah. you have to take that into consideration. Yeah, of course. It's quite useful, I think. <laughs> like, there is right now, like, the way um, Holger Shackle is not so, you know, like, if you want to use it for rules, it's, like, not so well defined. Like, if we have patterns around that, so that I think it's going to be worth the adoption. So at the moment, rules is, is an uh, uh, informal note of SACL. It's not, yeah. And there is no implementation report or, or support at the moment. I think there, Top Quadrant has, uh, has implemented this, but they also extended it a bit, from what I understand. Uh, yeah, for, for me, I didn't have any use case to extend our divinity with, with SACL rules. I only implement SACL at the moment. So that might be in the future, not for now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, one of the slides you mentioned that there needs to be better tooling and it's coming along. Any examples of tools to kind of get started? Like There are no generic tools actually, that's the problem. So uh, in our case, in, we had two research papers on that. We had a tool for field experts, which was our own design and we made an interface that they can actually select some some data and then use it to have some some quality checks and click the correct uh, errors that they had which was we developed on our own and when we used mechanical therapy for that we also had an interface because the users were not experienced so they had to have something quite simple is this correct or not it was very simple interface so it's also kind of specific to what you want to evaluate so it's it's yeah. Unfortunately, there is not much out there available for. Yeah. I was thinking more around the, like the XP support validation. 
for this, yes, there's a lot of support for, from different rules. There are different languages, like SEC, SACL, all which is we probably use from for many people. And there are, yeah, there are many tools that can be used here. Do you want uh, example tools or? or yeah. uh, <laughs> top quadrant is a SACL implementation. Are the top the top quadrant uh, okay. implementation is, is uh, uh, one. My tool also supports SACL and all, and and there are sex, many sex implementations for validation and. Yeah, there are many options. If you can, yeah, can discuss later if you want. Yeah. Um, I had a, had a quick question around you. You touched on data quality dimensions earlier and talked about kind of completeness and yes. uh, consistency, conformity, that kind of stuff. Yes, in semantic web data sets, what what tends to be the most common type of issue or the most common dimension that you see? That, that yields problems uh, I think if you look at the LD cloud the, the, the problem I see is mostly uh, consistent use of, of, of common vocabularies and one thing that's usually commonly abused is all same as so <laughs> yeah so people use some vocabularies but they don't use it as they were intended to be used and this makes consuming data from the load cloud a bit challenging at the moment. Um, yeah, there are many qualities, of course, in the data, but this is also a very big problem on, on, on the semantic website, not on the data side. Okay, so there are no other questions. A big round of applause and thank you for joining us. Thank you.